<clears throat> you should have two sheets in your possession this evening. One is the one that we're finishing up. The title at the top of it is Introduction to Bible Interpretation or Hermeneutics. And the second one is the one that's the proper method of interpretation. We'll get to that one shortly. But first we were talking about things which help and things which hinder. And last week we covered, I hit that again, there we go. Last week we covered all of those. There were two more we didn't quite get to on, the, on that back page of that one sheet. Uh, but these are the ones we covered. These things will hinder your interpretation of the Bible. The desire to please the world, because you'll be looking to that instead of the will of God. Uh, thinking that the Bible is only the property of a few, like the preachers, uh, the elders, or the Catholic Church, or something like that. The proof text approach, where there is no regard for context at all. You just pluck a text out because it sounds like what you want it to say, and sometimes you end up, most times you end up, completely butchering that verse. Mysticism, uh, making the Bible a book of wonders, reading without expecting to understand, and interpreting from sinister motives. Uh, where you're trying to find something for evil reasons. So we covered all that, but we had a couple of more we needed to finish up on. Uh, the next thing that will hinder your interpretation of the Bible is the thirst for distinction. Distinction. There are a lot of people who treat the Bible uh, in such a way that they're looking for somebody to kind of say, wow, you're so smart, I can't believe you figured that out. You're, you are such a scholar. And so they're looking for distinction. They're looking for a way to distinguish themselves uh, by trying to find something that no one else has ever found. Uh, and one of the, I'm trying to think of ways to illustrate that. One is, did you all know that Job could talk on the day he was born? The Bible says Job cursed the day of his birth. <laughs> you see, see there, so, so I said, wow, that's, and you know, it sounds right. If you don't know the Bible, it sounds right. But of course, the passage is talking about Job pronouncing a curse upon the day he was born, not cursing the very day that he came out of the womb. But you see how you can take a little passage and make it, so, but the guy said, well, that, I figured that out. Nobody else ever figured that out. Job was able to talk as soon as he came out of the womb. There was another one that I heard years ago. There was a guy who did not like the uh, ladies who wore the big buns on top of their head, just drove him crazy. So he had to figure out a way to get, get rid of that. And so we went to Matthew 24 where Jesus said, let him who's on the house top not come down. And so that was his way of saying, let those buns down. <laughs> so the thirst for distinction, the idea of trying to find some novel interpretation to set yourself apart, not because you're looking for truth, but just because you want to be seen as some kind of a guy who figured something out no one else has ever figured out. And then, of course, there's the emphasis on science. Nothing wrong with science in and of itself. Science is the search for knowledge. That's what the word science literally means. It means knowledge. And so there's nothing wrong with that, but you can uh, emphasize science to the point that it becomes deified. That's the problem. Science is always changing. Why is that? World knowledge. Yeah, yeah. our knowledge increases. We learn things that we didn't know before. And so science is an evolving thing. It, that's, that's why you know when the government say follow the science. Well, how can I follow something that's changing all the time? And especially the stuff you guys are spouting out that wasn't even scientific to begin with. But, but science is an evolving thing. You know, President Washington, the first president of the United States, was bled to death. That's how he died. He got sick, and back in his day, one of the medical treatments that, that they leaned on heavily was bleeding. And so they would just, they would let blood out of your veins for long periods of time. Well, eventually, you know, you're going to run out of blood. That's exactly what happened to President Washington. He was bled to death because of that emphasis on the scientific methods of the day. These things are always changing. And then, of course, the clear application of that to you and I is this idea of evolution. They always talk about how that's scientific. Evolution is scientific. It's nothing of the kind. Yes? I don't know much about Scientology, but there's a big push right now. Yeah, the religion of Scientology. Yeah, I don't know much about it either. There's a lot of Hollywood actors that are involved in that, Tom Cruise and some others. It's from what I gather, from what I've been able to pick up just reading here and there, and I've not dug into it a lot, it's almost like a cult. Uh, but I don't know much about what they believe or the specifics of it. But yeah, there is a big push for that 
a lot of the, the wealthy Hollywood elite are involved in that. Uh, but I don't know if it's emphasizing science like this or not. I don't know. It might be. Uh, but of course, go ahead. Masonic Lodge. What about, what about it now? Scientology is much like the Masonic Okay, they're t okay. I, you're saying that they're similar in their beliefs. Yeah. Okay. Now, see, I didn't know that. That's interesting, too. Um, but the evolutionary thing for us, because everybody says, well, that's scientific. And there's really nothing scientific about it. In fact, if you look at the laws of genetics, to me, that's the, that's the killer right there, the laws of genetics. Everything reproduces after its own kind. For some odd reason, cats always have cats. Well, the and science, to me, the science has evolved enough along now to disprove it. Yeah. Because if they say they can go back and look at all this genetics now, yeah. and they can study and find out and match my DNA. Yeah, you know, they'll tell what this, monkey we came from. That, yeah, then why don't it why it why don't it go back yeah. to a monkey? Why don't it go back to an amoeba? Yeah. How could they establish how could they establish my DNA from a dog or from a if it if it if we was all of the same in, ancestry or whatever, yeah, you know, there would be some then races. why wouldn't it all fall or, yeah. all the way back to them? Yeah. And it don't. It it it's man's is different. And 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 they can tell this these cells come from a man. These cells come from this animal. These are, to yeah. me, the science is, is, is disproved that theory. Yeah, and, and even as I was saying earlier, you're exactly right. As I was saying earlier, the genetic thing, everything reproduces after its own kind. Cats always have cats. Dogs always have dogs. You know, they never cross over where a dog becomes a bird. And with evolution, you have to have that. There's no way around that. At some point, one kind crosses over to another kind. There's no way to avoid that, and that's just genetically impossible. The, the, the genetic makeup of things won't let that happen. And, and so, but they'll, you know, there's a big push to silence in the scientific community to silence any dissenting voices. If you were a, a, an alleged scientist who questioned evolution, you would be, you would be blackballed, you would be sidelined, you would be ridiculed to the point where you couldn't get a job in the scientific community. That's how desperate they are to preserve the narrative of evolution. Uh, but if they had any proof, they wouldn't be afraid of that. Yeah, they shouldn't be afraid of it. If they're really pursuing the science, if they're pursuing knowledge, they shouldn't be afraid of that. Just adjust your theories. Because if you've got if you've got evidence with your argument, I don't care if it's science, if it's Bible, if it's anything. Yeah. You can you can have confidence, and you can confidently show somebody and and tell them, hey, this is what's right. Um, and it's with everything. If you know what's right, you can. You got you ain't you ain't got to be afraid of their argument because you got uh, you got the true facts to say here it is. Yes. You know. And what how this affects Bible interpretation is a lot of times Christians feel pressure because of all this push and the, and you're not being scientific and you're being an ignorant old uh, Christian who Bible thumping fundamentalist Christian and and so sometimes Christians are tempted to say well those days in Genesis weren't literal days. They were millions of years. And so God used evolution and, and the days were like millions of years and, and, and they began to compromise the teaching of the Bible. See, if, if you read Genesis, nobody with an unbiased mind reading Genesis and there was morning and there was evening, day one. <laughs> That's clearly talking about 24-hour days as we know them. It's not talking about millions and millions of years between each day or during each day. He's clearly talking about 24-hour days and consecutive days at that. Uh, there's just no doubt about it. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right, right consecutively in a row. So we, we feel the pressure sometimes and we compromise Bible teaching uh, because of the emphasis on science. And so if this is your approach when you come to the Bible, you will have difficulty arriving at the truth. You will have difficulty understanding the Bible and interpreting the Bible properly. This is what we're trying to say. These kinds of things will hinder in your study. So that concludes that first lesson that we went over, uh, the things that help, the things that hinder. And now we're going to be talking about the proper method of interpretation. And the proper method is called the inductive method. I want to read the introduction on this uh, page here. It says, there are many methods of Bible interpretation, and, and I'm going to list some of them here. 
Some take the Bible and allegorize everything. Everything in the Bible is an allegory. It's a story. There was no Adam and Eve. It's just a story. There was no Jonah. It's just a story to teach a truth. Uh, there was no Noah. It's just a story to teach a truth. So they're at, they take the Bible and they allegorize it. They turn it into almost, almost everything in the Bible is like a parable or an allegory. See, So some, that's one method of interpretation. Another method which is the other extreme, others literalize everything. Everything in the Bible is literal. It says what it means, means what it says. Well, you run into trouble with that. <laughs> you run into some serious trouble with that. Like uh, if you don't hate your father and your mother. Well, if you're going to take that literally, you, you, that's, some, that's a problem. You know, you've got to hate your parents. Who's, first of all, who's going to do that? Not very many people. And uh, second of all, just, it's just simply incorrect. Uh, another place I like to go when you talk about literalizing everything, just to kind of illustrate this, is in Revelation 12 about the great dragon. And if you literalize this, I want you to think about the picture here. Uh, verse, if I can find it here, verses uh, 3, Revelation 12, verse 3. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on its head. So you imagine a, a dragon with crowns on its head, first of all. That's kind of silly looking. His tail drew a third of the stars of the heaven and threw them to the earth. Now stop and think about that a minute. If you take that literally, a star is, well, the sun, for example, is a star. It just looks so big and bright because it's so much closer to the earth than the other stars are. But all the stars are just like the sun. They're just big balls. They're bigger than the earth. So if you took a third of the stars, imagine a dragon so big that it can scoop up a third of the stars up there in the sky in its tail. Now, who, who, who thinks that's literal? Only a fool. And then if he threw a third of those stars down to the earth, what would happen to the earth? It'd be gone. It'd be obliterated. So if you say, well, everything in the Bible is literal, that's not going to work. It's just you're going to end up throwing your Bible in the garbage and say this is a bunch of junk because it doesn't work. So these are different methods of interpretation. Some take everything as an allegory. Some people take everything literally. Uh, others seek to rationalize teaching that they find hard to accept. Well, I just find it hard to believe that Jonah was three days in the mouth of a, of a great fish. I, I just can't, can't hardly believe that. So they rationalize it away. They explain it away trying to say, well, this is just a story, or it wasn't, didn't really happen that way, and so they rationalize, or miracles, any kind of miracle. Pick, I can't believe Jesus fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fish. I just can't believe that. And so some have even said, well, Jesus, was he backed up next to a cave, and there was some people back in there in the cave had a whole bunch of bread, and Jesus was reaching back there and getting bread and pulling it out and reaching out and getting it. He didn't really multiply the loaves and the fishes. It was all a big parlor trick. So this is the people who rationalize. I can't accept the Bible as it is, so we're going to try and rationalize it and explain the stories away. Others appeal to church authority for official interpretations. You get that a lot in the Catholic Church especially. Uh, the, the church can give the official interpretation of the Bible because we can't understand it. And so those are different methods of interpretation. Uh, the allegorical method, the literal method, the rationalistic method. Uh, appealing to outside authority like the church. Those are different methods. The, the true method of interpretation, though, I don't want to spend a lot of time on all that except just to throw them out there uh, to, sh to tell you what they are. But the true method of interpretation is called the inductive method. The inductive method. And basically what you're doing with the inductive method is that you discover all the facts before you draw any conclusion. <sighs> Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that. Why don't we get all of our facts together before we figure out what this says? Doesn't that make a whole world of sense? So you induce, that's why it's called inductive, you induce, you put into uh, your thinking processes all the facts before you draw any conclusions. I'm not going to make up my mind on anything the Bible says until I put all the facts on the table. Of course, we're going to get the facts out of the Bible. Let's understand that's, the, the, that's what we're talking about, studying the Bible, understanding the Bible. So then you do that before you draw any conclusion. Now, deducing is drawing a conclusion, see. And some people get that backwards. They want to draw their conclusion first, 
they deduce what they think the Bible says, and then they try and bring facts to bear to support it. And that's completely backwards. That's just simply not going to work. You find your conclusion first, and then you go to the Bible and try to find proof for it. And that's just a completely backwards way, and it assures that you will have a wrong interpretation of the Bible. So what you want to do is put all the facts on the table. Say, I don't care what the subject is. Let's say it's baptism. And there are a lot of passages in the Bible on baptism. You want to know what the Bible says about baptism, the best thing for you to do is get a concordance and put every passage on baptism out there that you can look at. Look at every single one of them. Get all the facts on the table. Say it's the church instead of baptism. You want to, talk, you want to learn about the church. Then go to every passage that mentions the church. Put them all on the table. That's what we're saying here. Put all the facts on the table. Get it all out there first before you start drawing any conclusions. Don't make up your mind before you've got all the facts. Okay, That's what we're saying here. Um, when you're doing this, you're going to uphold truth as harmonious because if, if there is such a thing as truth, what is truth, by the way? Anybody, can anybody give me a definition of truth? It's what's right. It is factual, yeah. That which conforms with reality, <clears throat> that which is true, that which is factual. Uh, and so this is the idea of truth. And so truth is held as, as upheld as harmonious. Truth harmonizes with truth. Truth doesn't contradict itself. So you uphold the truth as harmonious. It's always in agreement. Uh, it, it's the same method of investigation you would use in a science lab. I used to work in a science lab in the plastics factory. I, I was a technical manager. And I did experiments all the time. And, and you, you do your experiments. You gather your facts. You gather your information before you draw any conclusions. That's, it's, so it's, it's done that way in the scientific field when we're talking about true science. And it's done that way uh, in a court of law. Ideally, sometimes the courts of law don't follow uh, things the way they should. But ideally, when you have a court of law, you have the prosecution and you have the defense. And you have a, a person here who stands accused of a crime. And the prosecution is bringing the evidence against this person. He was in the right place where the murder occurred. He had opportunity to commit the murder. He had motive to commit the murder. And you try and bring out all the evidence to show all that. And then the defense comes along and tries to knock all that down. And, and the goal, ideally, is to find the truth. Did this guy commit the murder or not? Now, when you look at the OJ trial, if those of you who are old enough to remember that, that was a farce. That's not what happened there. <laughs> it was kind of interesting. Uh, blood everywhere. Blood on OJ. Blood on OJ's car. Blood on OJ's clothes. But I, he didn't do it. Really? <laughs> I don't know who did it. You don't know who did it, and you got blood all over your car and blood all over your clothes. And, and so there, there was no truth sought there. But ideally, in a jury trial, you're trying to find the truth. You're trying to bring all the facts to bear. And the jury's job is to pass judgment on those facts. What do we think really happened here? Did he commit the crime or not? And so what I'm saying is this method of investigation is used not just for the Bible, but it's used in the jury, it's used in the scientific lab, it's used everywhere. That's the way uh, information is gleaned, the way knowledge is advanced. Okay? It's, I remember the passage, but there's a passage that backs that up in the in the Old Testament where it talks about someone comes and yes. pleads their case and you feel they're right, but then his neighbor comes examines him, you know, gives a yes. cross. And, you know, you hear you know, you hear one side of the story and you boy that they really done you wrong. Yep. And then you find out all of it, um, maybe that ain't maybe the that way it is. You know, and, and until you hear all of it, you can't you don't really know. That's right. In fact I've got that verse on these notes. If you go down in the middle of the page Number two, A, and then that passage is Proverbs 18, 17. That's the verse Keith was talking about there. Uh, the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines it. So here you've got, going back to our jury trial illustration. Well, I think this man here committed this crime. And here comes the evidence. He was there at the time of the, of the crime. He had the motive to commit the crime. He had the opportunity to commit the crime. And, he, and here's all, you know, they bring, and you say, boy, that sounds good. Maybe I think he did it. And then the defense gets up and cross-examines. And when you start hearing the cross-examination, the cross-examination, you start saying, well, maybe not. 
That's what you're driving at. That's what that proverb is driving at. So the point is, get all your facts. You can't have half the story. If you have half the story, that's all you've got is half the story. And you need the whole story if you're going to draw the right conclusions. The same thing's true with the Bible. You can't have half the story about baptism. You can't have half the, you know, you say, well, baptism's in water, uh, but I think it's by uh, pouring. Or I think it's by sprinklings. That's, that's only half the story. That's not the whole story. So you've got to get all the facts is what we're saying here. That's the idea. Now we'll see if we can illustrate that. We talked about the jury trial. Let's look in Acts 15 for just a second. We had an issue that came up in the early church. It came up originally in chapter 10, and it was in a different form. Should the Gentiles be allowed into the kingdom? That's the way it came up in Acts 10. And of course, how did God show in Acts 10 that the Gentiles were allowed? Anybody remember? Yeah, he poured out the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles at the household of Cornelius, just like he did on the Jews at the beginning. And then that evolved. They said, well, okay, well, God's accepted the Gentiles, but then that evolved. And what happened was, well, now we're going to take those Gentiles and, and make them be circumcised. And that's where it brings us to Acts 15. Uh, and we see here in verses 1 and 2, certain men came down from Judea. Well, if they came from Judea, who were they probably? Jews. Yeah. Surprise. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now notice, they're claiming scriptural authority here. The custom of Moses. This is what Moses handed down. This is what Moses delivered to us. Circumcision. It's right there in the Bible. And then they take that and they run with it. Unless you, meaning Gentiles, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now they've taken it one step too far. You cannot be saved. See, that's where they, that's, if you want to be, circumcision, Paul said, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision. It doesn't make any difference whether you're circumcised or not. It has nothing to do with whether or not you go to heaven. They're making it a heaven issue. If you don't do this, you cannot be saved. Okay. There, there was not even a Jew that needed to do that at this point. Yeah, right? at this time, they didn't even need to do that. That's exactly right. <clears throat> so they're, they're, they're taking this thing and they're trying to impose it on the Gentile converts. Verse 2 says, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension. That's just a nice way of saying they had a big fuss. <laughs> no small means great big, okay? No small dissension and dispute. This was a big fuss in the congregation. And they determined, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to solve this? How are we going to get to the bottom of this? Which is what we're talking about here, interpretation. That's what we're talking about. How are we going to get to the bottom of this issue? What is the truth? They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem. Now, Paul and Barnabas were preaching at Antioch at the time. Remember that? And they, they went out in chapter 13 and 14 on the first missionary journey, sent out by the church at Antioch, came back. So they're, they're members there at Antioch. So they say, well, you go back to Jerusalem. Why would they go to Jerusalem? That's where the apostles were. Yeah, that's where, number one, where the apostles were. He says, to the apostles and elders. And so they're the inspired messengers of God. Number two, going back to verse one, that's where all this got started, was in Jerusalem. So they came down from Judea. So let's go right back to the source. Let's go right back and find out what the truth is. We'll go right back to where this all started, and we'll go right back to the apostles, and we'll see if we can get to the bottom of this. And they're going to glean all their facts, okay? The Jewish council was there. They're the most likely the ones that got it all started. Yep. Yep. And uh, verse 5. Well, let's go with verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church, by the apostles and the elders, so they got welcomed. And they reported all the things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, and this tells you right where it got started, the, the, the sect of the Pharisees, these were, these were Christians, but they also had been Pharisees. You know, Paul was a Pharisee. Paul didn't do this, but Paul was a Pharisee. So there were Christians who came out of Phariseeism. Okay, that's who these are. Some of the sect of Pharisees who believed, so that means they were Christians, rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Well, that's the issue. So the issue is on the table. Do we have to do that or not? Now, the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. Notice, notice how they put this together. Verse 7 
through 11, first of all. When there had been much dispute, a lot of fussing, a lot of arguing, Peter rose up. Now, he's one of the apostles. Peter rose up and he said, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What's he talking about there? When he went to Cornelius', Cornelius household. household. That's right. So God, verse 8, who knows the heart, acknowledged them, the Gentiles, by giving them, the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. We talked about that a little while ago, Acts 10. Holy Spirit came on the household of Cornelius. And he made, watch it now, no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. They were saved without circumcision. He made no distinction. He didn't say, you need to be circumcised. So that's fact number one. The example of Peter going to the household of Cornelius and no circumcision was required. What did they have to do? Had to be baptized. That's right. Had to be baptized. But nothing, not a word said about circumcision. So Peter says, now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? The yoke of the law, we talked about. You can't be saved by perfect law keeping. We weren't able to do it. Our fathers weren't able to do it. And you want to go back to that system of perfect law keeping. Why? Instead, verse 11, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. We're all on the same page, same boat. Example number two, exhibit two, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul. Now catch this, Peter was at Jerusalem. Barnabas and Paul was at Antioch where the trouble was. And they're the, remember, they determined to come send Paul and Barnabas back. So this is people from Antioch. All the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked among, through them among the Gentiles. And they're referring there to Acts 13 and 14 on that first missionary journey. They went to all those Gentile cities and baptized all those people and started all those congregations and appointed elders in all those congregations. And God never said a word about circumcision, not one word. Hmm. 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 Verse uh, 13. After that, after they had become silent, that is Paul and Barnabas, after they hushed, James stands up. James says, I'm going, I'm going to settle this once and for all and forever. Okay, so look at how they're, doing. they're putting all the facts on the table. Exhibit A is the example of Peter and the household of Cornelius. Exhibit B is the example of Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. Not a word's been said in all those years about circumcision. James stands up and he says, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles and taken them out of people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree. Now watch that. We've heard from Peter, household of Cornelius. We've heard from Paul and Barnabas in the first missionary journey. Now we're going to hear from the Bible itself. So they're putting all the facts on the table. With this, the words of the prophets agree. And he quotes here from Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. Verse 16, after this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the what? Gentiles. Dun, 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 dun. This was right in your Bible all along. This was right in your Bible. Who are called by my name, says the Lord. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, what's that word therefore mean? I'm drawing a conclusion. I've got example of Peter, example of Paul and Barnabas, and the words of Scripture, the direct statement of Scripture. Therefore, I judge, I conclude, that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So they put all the facts on the table. What are the facts? Well, we've been preaching the gospel to the Gentiles for several years now. We've established congregations. We've appointed elders. The Holy Spirit's been poured out. The Holy Spirit's been uh, active among all that. And not a word has been said about circumcision. Now here comes these guys saying we've got to circumcise them. I don't think so. I don't think so. You're doing that on your own authority and not on the authority of the Lord. And that's what we're talking about with the inductive method. You bring all the facts to bear. Put all the facts on the table. 
and then you draw your conclusion. That's the only right way to study the Bible. Got a couple of minutes. Questions, comments? Yes. I find it interesting that, that Paul and Barnabas came back because Paul was just a pastor like the rest of them. He could make the decision yep. for the sake of unity and do it right. They, they conferred. Yeah, that's, that's a great true. point. Yeah, Paul could have just said, I'm an apostle, this is the way it is. But he didn't. Let's go out here, let's hash this thing out, let's discuss it openly with the other apostles. I, I think that's an excellent point. And that put everybody on the same page for the sake of unity, as you say. Let's talk this out. And I, I think that is an excellent point. Yeah, because, I mean, you think about it. It wasn't just important for those Jews that come to Antioch to know it. By going and doing it before all these, then all the Jews and all the Gentiles that spread from there, knowing this is the way it is. You know, yeah. you, know, you didn't just correct those two or three. You you made the you yep. more public so made a more bigger impact. impact. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, well we're out of time, so I'll hush. Next week we'll finish this one up, and I'll try to get some new sheets out there for the next lesson as well.